Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. How are you? I hope you're doing good today. We have a special guest on the line who is part of a unique legacy since 1984. He's been a member of genre-twisting musical phenomenon Los Lobos, known for infusing their Mexican-American heritage into rich textures that have been critically acclaimed for years. Earlier this year, they dropped a new record, Tin Can Trust, and returned to the islands for a four-island tour starting December 9th at Pipeline Cafe, December 10th at the Mac in Kahului, December 11th at the Honoka'a People's Theater on the Big Island, and December 12th on Kauai at Kilohana Plantation. It's a pleasure to welcome saxophonist, keyboardist, multi-instrumentalist, producer, and all-around talented guy Steve Berlin of Los Lobos. Aloha, Brother Steve. That's quite a build-up. Well, you're quite a guy. A big mahalo for taking just a few minutes for me. I'm impressed to know you. <laughs> and uh, thank you. I, I really do appreciate your time. And you guys have... A strong connection here. Let's informally, uh, if we will, try to trace it uh, and share some memories and sort of an overview of your past with dates here in Hawaii. My pleasure. Well, uh, so we've been, I believe, twice before. Um, you know, it's it's. I mean, you look. You guys live in a magical place, so it's always a blast to come there and, and hang out. It's it's. I'm always. I think I speak for everybody in the band. We're always sad to leave. Um, uh, I remember one of the, the the ones that stands out in my mind, at least, was when we opened for a Ween uh, in uh, in Honolulu. I guess this must be gone. She's at least ten years ago. And that would be your first time here. I think that was the first time. That was our first visit. Uh, we we toured. With, well, it was. I think we just did one show with them, and I'd never met them before. I was a fan, and uh, <laughs> they. Uh, I don't know if I'm not telling tales out of school, but they. Uh, <laughs> They they invited me to go with them to the beach to because a friend of theirs uh, this sounds horrible but a friend of theirs was in a car accident and they had all these um, uh, narcotic patches so they were going to put a bunch of narcotic patches on themselves and go hang out on the beach at <laughs> sunrise. <laughs> That's a good story. I, I had to I had to say no unfortunately, but uh, you know that so that stands out in my mind. Um, and why wouldn't it? And why wouldn't it, exactly? Um, but, uh, you know, the shows have always been great. Uh, I actually got to meet and hang out uh, with some folks the last time we were there, which was a blast. And uh, it's just, uh, like I said, it's it's always, always special and fun to be there. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy we're coming back. Yeah, last time you were here was just not that long ago. I'm thinking like five years ago or so, right? Yeah, yeah it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Yeah, that, that's what my memory uh, tells me. And do you have, uh, have you done any personal trips out here not connected to the band? No, unfortunately, I you know, I'm... I'm kind of work a lot so i don't get to do much in that way i think uh conrad our bass player has been if i'm not mistaken and i think dave has been on a family trip there in the possibly since the meantime but i, I have not okay well that's uh nice that that work brings you here for sure do you have any friends who live in the islands uh, i do actually well our promoter is a, is a friend of mine i consider him a friend of mine so looking forward to seeing him again um Aubrey, you talking about her? Uh, and then uh, we had a, another friend of ours whose name escapes me now, who sort of lives on and off the island. Uh, um, he's a guitar tech, a good buddy of ours, and uh, of course uh, Taj Mahal is a good buddy of ours who lives there. So hopefully we'll he'll be there when we're there. Okay, cool. You do? Ha- do you have any special guests that might be showing up? Nothing that you have to commit to, but that might be in the works. <laughs> You know, that's the kind of stuff that usually happens in the moment. So, uh, nothing planned. Um, but uh, if certainly, if any of our buddies are around, uh, and you know, it, it doesn't take much to get up on stage with those Lobos, I can tell you that much. So, <laughs> <laughs> if they're there, they're on stage usually. As a guy who has a real uh, sophisticated sort of musical background, are there any kind of uh, Hawaiian flavors that that you like in in terms of the unique, you know, pedal steel, or maybe any of the other, you know, ukulele flavors from the islands? Uh, well, you know, it's uh, we are fans of, of, of island music. Um, it's kind of interesting, you know. A lot of the instruments, uh, not that surprisingly, the same sort of uh, migration of the guitar and the ukulele sounds went to Mexico as well. So we have a couple instruments that are uh, virtually identical, I guess, to a, a ukulele. There's a, a called a jarana, is one that we use quite a bit, and people that come see us will see. Uh, Louis plays that, and uh, there's a, another one called a requinto, which is pretty similar, although it's played in a slightly different way than I believe in the island instruments are played, where you have like a, oh, for want of a, it's like the rat, like a rat tail comb, you play with like the sharp end of a comb, basically, it's a, it's kind of a weird 
thing, but it's super aggressive, super plucky kind of sound. But it's the the instruments are are largely the same. They're all four string um, tuned in fifths. So it's uh, anybody that plays one of those can play a ukulele. I would believe in, but and vice versa. Well, it could be some nice jams in store, huh? Yeah, huh? Well, you know, if anybody, you know, got any badass ukulele, <laughs> ukulele flavors, come on, we have the instruments just sitting there for most of the set, so jump on up. That's what's cool about you guys. I, I love that about, about your band. And uh, congrats to you on a fantastic new album, um, which I've been digesting over the last several days. I'm, I'm very impressed with it, dude. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And the thing that I kind of was hoping you'd share a little bit, the approach. Sometimes I think, Steve, and, and you'd know better than me because you've made a hell of a lot of records, but I think the approach to the record might influence how it ends up sounding. And from what I understand, the approach to this was very bare bones, very clutter-free, not a glitzy studio scene, but quite the opposite. And I was hoping you'd sort of take us to that gritty place. Well, we haven't really been in a glitzy studio for an awfully long time. I'm <laughs> not sure if there's even many of those left. Um, uh, since, uh, oh God, roughly like 19, what would it be, probably 2000 or so, we we started uh, doing our records at uh, Caesar, our guitar player's house, in a uh, converted garage. So ain't no glitz in there. Um, <laughs> uh, and it, w- it served our purposes extremely well. We did, uh, I guess, starting with... Uh, Morning Aslan, The Ride, uh, Town in the City, a couple of the other like soundtrack stuff in the kids' record were all done at Caesar's house, um, and we made it work. It was you know perfect for us in that the way that we worked, but it was always somewhat limited in that we could never all play live, and uh, so we sort of adapted the process of sort of piecing the songs together, where you know like one or two guys would play like drums and guitar, and then we would add a bass and then add everything else to it. And it never really it never it really encumbered our process just because more often than not, that's the way the songs would get constructed. In other words, the songwriter knew the song, and we had this this rule, which I don't recommend for anybody else in a band out there, but you know, we never rehearse, ever. It's the R word. So Don't try this at home. Yeah, don't do this. You know, I don't <laughs> with anybody else I work with, but Lobos just sort of has this thing where you know we just don't do it ever and we show up to the recording studio and basically everybody comes with their uh with their ears on and and starts sort of putting it together in the moment as it's happening so we, I, it's something we sort of found on kiko that that we like the sound of exploration we don't the record prior to kiko which was the neighborhood we had rehearsed to uh, to death basically and it was i don't think the record i mean i'm proud of the record don't get me wrong but it was uh the process of recording was not in any way enjoyable for for us, so we're just sort of like spitting it out, and we found that it just doesn't work that way. So we we went the complete polar opposite version, which was not knowing the songs at all, and just hoping we could <laughs> hold on and get through them. And, and it sounds okay, and so far it seems to be working. So anyway, long story, a little shorter. Uh, Caesar moved, and uh, so we didn't have that place anymore, and uh, so we were sort of looking around for a different kind of vibe, and uh, we stumbled upon. Um, the studio in East LA, which literally was down the street from where the guys grew up, and it was a pretty—I you know, should say pretty—extremely funky uh, former warehouse with uh, basically just shards of drywall and broken furniture and broken drum heads and broken chairs. Not even many of those, um, <laughs> but it had a vibe and a sound and kind of fit our mood in a weird way. I guess you could say we were just kind of ready for something like that, and it. What it really afforded us was the ability to play live again because the room was big enough and they actually had enough headphones and um, mic pre's and all the other stuff that we had sort of gotten away from recording at Caesar's house. Um, uh, it would just sort of like it lent itself to the the ability to play live. So we just kind of seized that and really went for it uh, playing live as a band again, which I think uh, you could sort of hear in the record, the, like um, uh, Tin Can Trust... Um, Jupiter and the Moon, Burn It Down, uh, Yo Canto were all done pretty much. I mean, we added stuff to it. The, the vocals were never done live just because that's usually the last thing that goes on. But the tracks themselves were all cut uh, pretty much live. And I think it really gives the record a, um, an interesting twist. And it, I don't, to me, it, it sounds it sounds different than the ones where we piece them together just because you sort of hear the interplay and we left more than a few of the mistakes in. So you know, we're back to playing live again, which is i got to say, a lot of fun. And on the other side of that, which I think you pointed out, is 
instead of coming to the project with a lot of completed pieces, each maybe a couple different band members each coming with several, and then everybody else has to learn them and get around them. I like the approach. Uh, I think what you're saying is you guys show up with maybe some ideas, and then from there try to gel with other people's concepts, and, and the songs pop up. Sort of. I mean, it's really... Uh, it's. The, the one part of the process that's never really changed is that the songwriter really kind of rules the day. So um, depending upon whose song it is, either Dave's or Caesar's, it's always they're kind of in charge. I mean, we haven't really had a producer really since 2001. I mean, it's always pretty much been us, and that's kind of the way things roll, where the whoever the songwriter is gets to sort of decide how it's done and how it's recorded more or less and how we, we play it. So... Um, it you know that that part of it works out well and um just in terms of how we how it kind of goes i mean it's always terrifying at the beginning just because we don't have you know nobody knows if they have anything you know we we all kind of show up on the the first day and it's just absolutely terror packed cuz more often than not what becomes a song initially is is something that seems incredibly fragile and not really you know even you wouldn't even call it a song. I mean, it's barely, uh, it'd be like a zygote, I guess. <laughs> or that that moment of conception where there's just a couple cells, so we're never really sure if that's going to be a song or if it's just a, you know... A stray hook. And it's always kind of like, uh, I don't know, I'm sure all of us sort of feel the same way, like, oh my God, how do we get here again? You know, this is horrible, why are we doing this? And we suck and all that stuff, and then <laughs> it's, it kind of goes away, and then you're, you're making a record. But it's always, uh, those first couple of days are absolutely... Uh, I'm sure that's why we only make records every four years because you have to kind of forget about that feeling. Because <laughs> it's such a process. Well, it's a it's a process that you know it always ends up turning out fine. But the first couple days are always just like, oh god, you know, really. <laughs> and I say that knowing that I'm making music for a living because I don't you know I'm not saying that don't no one should feel sorry for anybody unless Lois. I mean we we have a dream life and a dream career, but uh, given that, uh, it's always those first couple moments are just like. Wow, this is this is really not a good idea. <laughs> I like that. That's some insight. So it's like an awkward sort of moment there. Awkward and it, awkward would be pleasant. It's more like you know abject terror, really. Wow, <laughs> that's insight, dude. You're really candid. I appreciate it, Steve. That one of uh, I grew up in the bar. Bu- didn't grow up. I did uh, twelve years of living and oh, going. I'm not either. So yeah, <laughs> I lived in in Boston for. Uh, for 12 years and um so susan tedeschi is someone who um is familiar to me from her long journey possibly you know probably before most people were aware of her and i was hoping you'd sort of share some of your own connections to susan and how she ended up uh adding a really a really smooth piece to the record well we 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 know her and, and love her uh, we've played with her a couple times and um just enjoy the hell out of being around her basically um and uh, we were pretty much at the end of the process. Uh, the, the record was, like I said, you know, the vocals are the last thing to to go on usually. So we were kind of at that last, last bit of, uh, wow, well, are we done yet? Uh, maybe this could use this or that. And we were talking about the song uh, Burn It Down, which is the, the first song in the record. And Dave, I think, said, boy, it'd be nice to hear a woman's voice on here. And um, The last uh, two, uh, three weeks of the record were done um, not in that studio that I told you about, but on the road, because uh, Dave and Caesar were doing this um, Experience Hendrix tour where they, uh, they along with Billy Cox and about 45 guitar players, go around the country and yeah, yeah. do a bunch of Hendrix songs. So to get the record finished on time, I had to go follow them around the world <laughs> on their tour, <laughs> uh, booking studios every place they stopped for more than a day. Um, uh, and that's how we basically got all the vocals and the end of the, the last solos done. So anyway, so they're on the road doing this Hendrix thing, and um, one of the things about the Hendrix tours, they sort of have a revolving cast, and they were on their way from uh, wherever, they, wherever they were to Chicago, and Susan was uh, coming on, and they were actually, David Caesar were leaving, um, and just sort of lined up magically that the one day that Susan had off that we just happened to be in Chicago and we managed to on her really her only day off for I think two months uh, she was unbelievably gracious enough to come in and and come sing burn it down with us and I think she just did an amazing job 
Yeah, man, she slammed. It's very like it's not, you know, it's just part of the cast, if you will, um, on the song. But it's, it sounds really nice. And man, is her husband one ferocious dude on the guitar? Or what, man? I was gonna say both of them are just like, man, they're like the coolest people in the world, and just unbelievably great. I mean, beyond being some of the best musicians in the world, they're just the coolest people in the world, and we just love both of them. And anytime we're anywhere nearby, we're we're front row center. Bro, when when I lived in Boston, I saw Derek when he was 12, opening for Colonel Bruce Hampton in the Aquarium Rescue Unit. He was 12 years old. He had the whole band was was adults. That is this, amazing. This little kid with this uh, like the red SG. I'll never forget it. I mean, he's uh, I know what you mean. It's been a long trip with him. It's weird looking at him, you know, all these years later. Well, he doesn't look much more than 12, really. <laughs> But I mean, it's just, it's spooky. After something like that, you're like, I can't believe this cat is. And then he has the, like you said, I mean, the two of them together. It's like, that's a, a powerful musical relationship. The uh, the concept and usage of the term tin can trust, um, kind of explain how you guys are, t- are twisting with that. Well, it was, uh, you know, the, it's it's sometimes kind of, you know, it's, it's challenging to come up with a conceptual title for our records it's always uh, it, it it's not it, it's never apparent uh, what it is while we're working on it you know town of the city the ride like all that stuff we always end up uh, well kiko obviously did, that kind of helped uh, but you know if it isn't an, obviously an album or a song title it's always sort of this bizarre thing and it was um the lyrics for that song showed up very 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 late in the process um and basically, it's uh, Louis' concept of having nothing. I mean, it sort of spoke to a lot of the stuff that was going on in our world and the world at large. You know, just uh, being in East L.A. every day, seeing what the economy was doing to the folks there and dealing with that made for... Uh, uh, it was pretty profound. Uh, it affected us in a profound way. So as we were trying to come up with a title and of the record and that song it just sort of like it really struck a nerve that well you know you may have nothing you may be broke but as long as you have love you're you got something mm. and that's kind of where that that song came from we thought it was a uh, a universal enough concept to make the whole record that as well uh, that's a huge one i love it you summed it up so nicely uh it wouldn't be right to talk to you and not connect on something that sort of uh we go full circle kind of together. It's been 21 years since I saw you live, and it's as if on cue, this record bears an ironically similar path in that when I saw you, you were opening for the Grateful Dead at Giant Stadium in the summer of 89, and now you're back with a further Los Lobos connection to the dead through the years, of course, having a lot of dates you did with them. You covered them on that on that first Dead tribute record. And now you're covering West L- L.A. Fadeaway. You got Robert Hunter helping out with, with some lyrics uh, on All My Bridges Burning. When did you guys first cross paths with the Grateful Dead and how? Um, well, we were fans first. So, I mean, it was always kind of there. But... Um the uh, the first show, and oddly enough, it's kind of a coincidence that we played with them was at uh, Laguna Seca in eighty uh, uh, eight year. What year? Eighty six. I say. Is that hmm. right? I would think. I would thought it was Dead Bass lists your first ones as eighty eight, but maybe they're wrong. It doesn't seem like. It seems like it would have been pre La Bamba, but uh, um, well, well, we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we were, as I said, huge fans. <clears throat> and we we had heard that Jerry was a huge fan, uh, and which was pleasing to no end. And then we met him, and it turns out he was you know, like almost beyond a, a huge fan. I mean, he was like he couldn't have been happier that we were there to play with him. He was literally like just all just as, as warm and really cuddly as a, as he could be, and <laughs> ended up pretty much spending every moment that he wasn't on stage hanging out with us and telling stories and. Um, he, uh, my abiding memory of that show was like at one point looking back, and it was the middle of the afternoon and the, the Monterey Coast, so it's kind of gray and misty, and like it always is there. And um, there's Jerry kind of kneeled down behind Dave's amplifier, smoking a cigarette as if he was a roadie, like just kind of waiting for a string to break or something like that. <laughs> just like he couldn't get close enough to to us and to Dave to, you know, like he he literally would have crawled inside the amp if there was space. It seemed like so. That was kind of a magical moment. And then we, as you noted, we 
we went on to do a couple a couple tours with him, I guess, and became friendly with the the whole organization. Then we ended up doing the first uh, further tour with um, uh, Bobby and uh, and Mickey the, the first time that went out. And we've always sort of kept this uh, very respectful but uh, deep connection with the uh, obviously with the fans, but also with the organization with uh, Dennis McDally and. When we did um, the ride back in uh, whenever that was, 2003 or four. I'm sorry, the, I, I, the dates just kind of fade together. It's totally cool, brother. 2004, we uh, we reached out to Robert Hunter to uh, co-write a song with us, which turned out great. And then uh, this time around, as I was talking about before, like those first couple of days, we were just trying to like not feel terrorized. Uh, one idea I think Caesar had was to cut uh, to actually learn. West LA Fadeaway because we had sort of been half-assing it, trying to like play it without knowing it for a long time, and then just for something to kind of to get us going and to sort of figure out the, the sound of the studio, we, we ended up uh, cutting that song, learning it finally, which was a good thing, and then uh, recording it, um, and that was another, I want to say it was the first take, it was probably the second take actually that went on the record, but that was one of the, the ones that really kind of showed us that, wow, this you know, we can play live, and it sounds good, and it's going to work, and it's kind of, it really kind of sort of set the tone, if you will, for the the rest of the record, and and then as we went forward on the record, we had uh, another song that needed lyrics, and um, we thought, well, hey, let's let's see if we can find Robert and get him to do it, and it's kind of amazing, you know, we, we I, I remember the day very clearly, we were playing in San Francisco, and I was coming from the airport, and uh, I called, or actually I sent him an email, at noon and I stopped for coffee with a friend of mine and by the time I walked out of the coffee place he had already sent some lyrics it was like uh, it was ridiculous I mean either he's the fastest lyric writer in the world or he must have like a stockpile or something like that but it seemed to me it was like wow that's ridiculous no, nobody can write a song in 45 minutes but I guess Robert Hunter can pocket full of lyrics yeah clearly <laughs> that song became uh, uh, All My Bridges Burn uh, it's a great one, and uh, nice to see the uh, the dead connection all, all these years. It's really uh, it's special for us. I mean, we still you know miss Jerry terribly, and you know I, I have to say I think about him a lot, especially as we were doing that stuff. Um, but it's nice to be able to keep that connection. Nice, really nice to be able to like when we play San Francisco, that a lot of the the dead family show up. It's always pretty darn cool. Yeah, and when, being a dead fan, you always knew that the what you were saying, it's different hearing you say it. Of course, it's priceless to hear your recollections of it, which is why I asked. But as a dead fan, I saw him 44 times, so I put in a little bit of time with him. Um, yeah. and, and I know that uh, you know they loved you guys. What, what Beyond that one moment with Jerry, I'm assuming he was your guy you were closest to? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he was really the one that... Uh, I mean, the other guys are sort of uh, a little more guarded, I think. In, and that's in no way disparaging, but they're not as, uh, Jerry was just like the most, really, he was like your favorite uncle, really. He was just like, every time we'd see him, he'd just be like, hey, how you doing? What's going on? I love this. You know, just just want to talk about music. Have you heard this record? Yeah, it's amazing. It's just, it's kind of like who he was. The other guys are a little more, um, uh, just less garrulous, let's say. But I've come to know uh, Phil. I've, I've worked with uh, Jackie Green, who sings in Phil's band, and you know, Phil's a really incredibly warm, cool guy as well. But just very, you know, they're all really, really different people. They they're, couldn't be more different. Yeah, I, I know, dude. I've interviewed Bobby five or six times and Phil several times and Mickey and uh, Billy Kreutzman. And you could not have I mean, they are four, those four dudes are as different as could be. I can only imagine Jerry. What a great description. Cuddly, you called him. He always looks like a, like a cuddly bear. He really was, just just you know you just wanted to hang out with him right you know i have a couple uncles that i felt the same way about and he's you know he's another one we're just not related that i know of. <laughs> well we're looking forward to your visit and it's a shame that uh, not it's a shame but it's, it's you're coming a couple uh days i guess it's about a week after paul and fred from little feet come through they're doing like a acoustic thing here um and a great idea they're they're kind of mad at us actually right now if you talk to them just tell them that we're really sorry why i thought you're doing the big gig with them in negro we had to pull out of it I'm oh like, you're kidding uh we're we got we were offered it we're opening for eric clapton for a month whoa it was either or and we just it was uh you know i mean god knows i'd love to go to negro with little feet but it just we couldn't do both it was just really ridiculous timing and we had to 
back out, and they're very. They're, I know they're pissed off, and I, I can't express how sorry I am to to do that to them. And you know, we will we'll, hopefully we'll mix up to them somewhere along the way. But uh, yeah, if you talk to them, just tell them Los Lobos says they're really, really, really sorry. Oh, I'm definitely. I'm talking to him in a few days. <laughs> uh, but that's uh, what a. Uh, so that's a U.S. Clapton. Where are you going with Clapton? All over the. I think it's all over the country. I haven't actually seen the final list of dates, but it's. Uh, I mean, that's a. Yeah, I, you know, what do you? I mean, how do you pick? Dude, it's okay. You did the right thing. I hope so. But okay. I feel bad for those guys, and I was. You know, I'm a huge Little Feet fan. I'm as big a Little Feet fan as there is, and so. And I, I like you and the dead. That's that was the little feet was was my dead. So I've seen him a zillion times with and without Lowell. So I was really looking forward to hanging out with him, and hopefully playing with him. Now it's gonna have to wait a little while. So I think you're doing the right thing, and congrats on that with Clapton. That is large, my man. I'm high fiving you on that. It should be a should be well. We'll see. <laughs> I hope it's fun. No Derek with him this time, yeah. Uh yeah, oh, jeez, I don't know. I guess not. Remember when Derek did? That? I saw that show. Yeah. I, uh, well, didn't even do I got it. You know, it's, I don't even associate this guy. I mean, Dirk's a almond brother in my mind, so. Yeah, but in, in, uh, 06, he did this long stretch of dates with Clapton. And, uh, I actually, I've, I've met, I've been around Derek a long, long time, as you know, so I'm, it was a big deal to me. I flew back from Hawaii and saw him at MSG, interviewed him right before the show and stuff. It was colossal for me to see, to go from the paradise in Boston in 1992 when he was 12 to 2006 Madison Square Garden and in the middle of his solo spot and he's the only guy out there on stage he hits he builds this peak and the whole crowd stands up dude I I got chills I'll never forget um not at all surprising yeah so believe me I mean I love I love the you know them in a way that I'm sure you could understand so well I'm high five and I hope this was okay interview yeah, it's great man it was, it was a lot of fun getting to talk to you. Would you mind doing a, a quick in-person interview, or would that cut into your time? No, absolutely. I, I get there. Uh, I arrive at two ten, so yeah, I'll be. Uh, should be plenty of time. I think we play at nine or something like that. Okay. Well, if we can work it out, I'll just go through Lauren. I guess is that cool? Lauren's probably the easiest way. Awesome. Travel safe. Thank you again. It was a pleasure, and uh, you're a solid brother. I hope hope uh, the trip out here is a wonderful one. Thank you, man. Come say hi. I will. Take care, brother. All right, bye. Aloha, this is Steve Berlin of Los Lobos. You've made a great choice. You're tuned to the only show that matters. We're having fun with our friend Dave Lawrence. Hey, brother Dave. <laughs> Let's get that 420 started. Would you look at that thing? Aloha, this is Steve Berlin from Los Lobos. You've made a great choice. You're tuned to the only show that matters with my friend Dave Lawrence. Rock on, Dave. Aloha, this is Steve Berlin from Los Lobos. I'm hanging out with my friend Dave Lawrence, and I'm finally getting my chance to say these magic words. Hey, brother Dave, have a happy, healthy 420. <laughs>